Amen, amen. Um, we are in a brand new series. Uh, it's called You Asked For It. And we've done this at least five years in a row. Uh, it's one of our most popular series that we do during the year. Uh, we opened it up for questions to you. We got 55 questions back from all of you. And so for the next 55 weeks, we're going to preach every single... No, just joking. Um, there are great questions, though. Uh, you guys did amazing on that. Thank you so much. Um, but the one that we're going to do today is pretty massive. Um, I want you to just see this thing, what, what one of you wrote. Paul stayed strong. He's talking about the apostle Paul here, or she. Paul stayed strong in spirit when he was imprisoned. How can we do that with our modern challenges? How can we stop resentment and focus on God? I think a pastor wrote this question or a theologian or professor or somebody. I mean, it's amazing the way that they put this together. Um, and I just had to preach it. I mean, they, they, they kind of stick us right in this spot, which we're gonna get to in a minute. It's gonna be Philippians three and four. When Paul was in prison, the apostle Paul, amazing, like Saint Paul, like this incredible spiritual guy. He's in the middle of prison, like the worst possible thing you can imagine. And there he doesn't get resentful or bitter toward God. And the person's asking if he cannot get bitter toward God in the midst of my prison that I'm in today, how can I not get bitter toward God? So disappointed. Um, you ever been there? It, it begs the question, what's your prison? Which I hate when pastors do that. What's your prison? But the person did it here. You asked for it. So there it is. What's your prison um, is what's kind of begged there. So, so let's, let's get some of the Bible study pieces out of the way so that we can get to the real meat of this question. First off, we got to talk about the fact that Paul was in prison um, and look at what he said. So Philippians 4.11, so I'm just going to jump you right to the conclusion. And then what we're going to do is we're going to back up from there is the way that today's study is going to go. I'm going to tell you what Paul said, and that's what this person is referencing but then we're going to have to read behind it. We're actually going to have to go a full chapter, maybe chapter and a half behind it to see how Paul got to the conclusion that he got to. But here's Philippians 4.11. I have learned, he said, how to be content with whatever I have. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or an empty stomach, whether slave or free, prison or not. Um, Paul once he had his Damascus Road experience and he got saved and Jesus reached out to him and changed his life, Paul's adult career in the church, um, preaching the gospel, planting churches, was around 30 to 35 years he had time before he was martyred for the cause of Christ. And during that 30 years or so, he was imprisoned three different times. So I'll just tell you very briefly, one of them was in Philippi, which is who this letter was written to. He was in prison in Philippi when he planted the church there with a guy named Silas. And if you know that story, they were actually in prison all night long singing hymns to God. And as they sang hymns in prison, an earthquake happened to free the two of them. That's his first prison experience. His second prison experience was around AD 60, and he was arrested in Jerusalem and he had this massive journey that they took him all the way to Rome and he was put in prison there, but he was put kind of in an apartment, kind of house arrest. It was a rented house that he was in. And I'll describe that to you in just a second. The third time that he was imprisoned, he had actually gotten free from his house arrest and he got imprisoned the third time and this is the final time. And he gets sent and this is in AD 67, AD seven years later, He's in the actual dark, individual, isolated prison cell with nobody around him. He's probably martyred by Emperor Nero at that point. Um, that's not described in scripture to us, but early church fathers have documented um, that that's what happened to him. That's how he met his end. So as he wrote Philippians, it was the middle of the three imprisonments. He's in this rented house. 
Um, why is he in this rented house? Because along the journey, he built trust with some of the guards, some of the Roman guards that were taking care of him. They, they started to trust him a bit. So he's under this house arrest, but he's still under supervision. He can't leave it. He's actually chained to another Roman soldier the entire time. Uh, every four hours, they would, they would tr- uh, uh, transition to another soldier, would have to be chained to Paul. And so you've got the apostle Paul, the greatest probably gospel preacher ever, and he gets a fresh stream of unbelieving Roman soldiers strapped to him every four hours. You can just imagine what took place. Oh, yeah. He's letting them know about Jesus. So he describes this Philippians 1.12 almost like his purpose. He says, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. Paul's there and he's like, I know I'm in prison, but it's not stopping me. God's still giving me purpose in my chains, which is an amazing thought. Have you ever put something off because you were so busy? Even something that God told you to do because you were too busy to do the thing. And then God comes along and stops you, makes you stop, and you find yourself refocused again. Paul, not only did he reach those guards who eventually were in the palace, but he wrote the books of Ephesians, Philemon, Colossians, and Philippians that we know of in that house arrest that he was in. God had a purpose Maybe he was too busy to write some of the things that God knew we would need 2,000 years later. God has a purpose in your prison. He had a purpose in Paul's prison. Maybe he's got a purpose in your prison. It's not even maybe. He does have a purpose in your prison. So what's our prison? What prison are you in? What's going on? What feels like bondage? What feels like this is the room I did not want to be in, but this is where I am. And it can be anything. Let's talk about disappointments and resentments and expectations. I've got some ideas for you. What about I expected to have way more money and as much money at least as my neighbors do or my friends do. I expected to be wealthier than I am. I expected to feel happiness much more often than I do. I expected to be healthier, prettier, and more fulfilled. (laughs) I expected my family to be healthier, prettier, and more fulfilled. I expected my family to stay together and to love me more than they do. Starting to get into the tough stuff now. I expected to live with less trauma or sickness or tragedy. I expected to escape the betrayals and the cruelties of other people. I definitely expected God to bless me more or at least protect me more than he has. If that was right there in front of you on a piece of paper and and you had the opportunity, how many of those would you circle for yourself? Again, it's just something to get you thinking about I had these things that I expected and God's a good God and God loves me and, and, and then these things, they didn't happen and, and now I'm in this place of disappointment and this place of disappointment, in a way, it feels like the walls that are coming in on me. And I'll just say this on the front end, I think your prison of disappointment is probably much, much worse than any prison Paul was ever put in because his was only physical. Sometimes we get bitter at God. Sometimes we get angry at God. There's a Psalm that talks about this. It was written by a choir director in the Old Testament named Asaph. So not all the Psalms in the book of Psalms were written by King David, by the way. Some of them were written by Asaph. So here's one of his, Psalm 73. He says, when my soul was embittered, and he's saying this to God, by the way, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant I was like a beast toward you, God. Nevertheless, I am continually with you and you hold my right hand. I love that picture. It's God's in the cell with him holding his hand. He's like, I know you're with me and I know you're holding my hand, but I'm like a beast towards you. You ever been like a beast toward God? I know it's a weird picture. So angry at him, so bitter at him. 
almost can't even stand to pray because what he allowed to happen in your life and you're in this dark valley and these are the feelings that you have toward God. And when you're in church and when you're around other Christians, these are the things you can't admit out loud because you don't have a category for this. And I get it, but this was written thousands of years ago for you. Because I was like a beast. Guys, I've been there. I've been that level of angry at God. Okay. Actually, let's, let's take a beat. Let's take a breath. And let's pray. Because I think some things are getting stirred up in you right now. And you've got a choice at this moment in the message. Am I going to face the things that this means for me? Am I going to be honest with myself and let the Lord come and bring his healing. It's a choice. Let's pray. Jesus, I think you're so good, Lord, that you would come into a room like this with so many different souls, even the people that are watching online right now. And you see every single one of us individually, you know the kind of prison that we're in right now. You know the kind of angry we are toward God right now. So Lord, would you come and would you give us the honesty to admit it, to see it, to own it? God, I thank you for truth. And I thank you for the power that is in truth for us. Even if it feels like you're, you're stirring up some of the old pain right now, it's worth it, God, so that you can deal with it. Jesus, you're so good. And we trust you in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Okay, so the rest of the question, how, how do we do this prison thing like Paul did, but not go to resentment? Because Paul had a, he had an ability, he had a maturity, he had a faith. How do we have that? So I'm gonna break this down for you. Um, as I looked at that one verse in Ephesians 4, or I'm sorry, Philippians 4.11, in that spot, he kind of describes knowing this secret to contentment. And so then I started reading backwards, looking for what he had to say as far as how he got there. And I ended up way back in Ephesians, or I'm sorry, in Philippians 3, trying to understand it. And here's kind of the, the four part steps that I think Paul takes us through. Number one is you must buy Jesus with all you have. Buy him with all you have. And that's some confusing language, but we're going to explain it. Next, you've got to treasure Jesus as the center of your life. You've got to choose joy daily and turn your fears into prayer. And then number four, learn the secret of contentment. Now, as I go through these four sections, and, and I'm going to even number the slides so you can see where I'm at. Some of them may really ring true to you. And you may say to yourself, this is the thing that I struggle with, and I need to walk with God on this. Others may not be for you as much, but Paul gives you all of this stuff. All right, first off, go back to Philippians 3.5. Here's what he says. Here's where he starts the line of thought. He says, I was a member of the Pharisees. He's talking about his past before he became a Christian. He said, I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. And I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. So Paul's saying, I grew up as a religious guy. And I decided religion and following the law was the way to get closer to God. And by doing that, he said, I was perfect at it. How many of you could say that? None of us, really. But he's like, I was good at this religion thing, for sure. He was a pro. And then come down into verse seven. But whatever gain I had in all that religion, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ as my Lord. He's like, I'm giving this stuff up. Everything that I'm giving up, I'm counting it loss or garbage in order that I might have more of Jesus. In order that I might have more of Jesus. For his sake, Jesus' sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish or that's just garbage 
in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. Okay, we got to break this down because this is, this right here is kind of the heart of the whole message. What Paul does in his garbage sorting here is just massive. So there they are. See my extra little fancy underlines? That was very important to me. Um, because those three, these three statements break down his thought process. It's gonna make sense to you. So first off, he says, I came to a point in my past when I needed to get saved. And when I needed to get saved, I had to take all my old religion, everything that I felt like I'd ever done for God, and it had to go on a trash heap so that I could have the treasure of Jesus. Now, he's not talking about salvation by works there. He's just saying, I want as much of Jesus in my life as possible, which meant everything else in my life had to get smaller. Does that make sense? Does, does God ever come in and give you a trial where you have to let go of something and as that thing you let go of becomes smaller, God starts to become bigger? Amen. Because love and loyalty kind of go that way. Whoever's number one gets the most, right? That's right. And we can't love everything. We can't be loyal to everything. And God comes and says, I'm jealous for the number one spot in your life. And so Jesus, or, or Paul says here, he says, he says, back then, all that gain that I had, past tense, see it. He's like, I gave all of that up and considered it loss. But then in verse eight, he says, indeed, I count everything as loss. So if you're paying attention, you're noticing two things in his language there. He left the past tense and now he's in present tense. And he says, and now, even though I counted everything lost before, everything in my life today I keep counting as loss. I keep throwing it into the garbage pile. Except this time, he's not talking about just his old religion. He switched it to everything. He said, everything in my life is lost compared to Jesus. That means all my possessions. That means all my financial goals. That means my career. That means my house. That means my family. You're like, what, people? Yes, people. Jesus even says that. He's like, compared to the love that you have for Jesus Christ, when you look at your mother and father, it should almost look like hatred. And I know that's so weird to say, but that's what he said. Because in comparison, your love is so much greater for Jesus himself. And so Paul says, everything in my life right now, I still consider on that garbage pile, my freedom. He's in jail. Uh, my legacy uh, he doesn't know if the, if the church of Jesus Christ is gonna continue to go on. He doesn't know if he, his, his words or his letters are gonna be read by anybody else after he's dead. He doesn't have the luxury of knowing any of that stuff. This could be the end of him. He's like, I, I'm ready to give all of it up for the sake of Jesus Christ, my relationship with him. He's willing, all of it gone. And then the third step, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. See, that's third. So he was past tense. This is what I did at salvation. This is what I promised Jesus I would do. I surrendered everything as a promise. And then in my current daily life, everything that I see in my life, I keep surrendering it to him and saying, that's on the garbage pile compared to you, Jesus. But the third level is, and now I've actually suffered the loss of it. Because there he is in prison and he's got nothing. So many of us Christians, we promise to give everything to Jesus. We surrender everything in our hearts, in our commitments. It's a, it's a spiritual promise that we make to God. God, you've got everything. But then when God comes al along to cash the check, we don't like it. When God comes and says, I'm gonna remove this from your life, we get upset. I just took the thing that you told me was mine in the first place. I just asked you to sacrifice in reality what you said you were letting go of back here. And, and, and by the way, he doesn't do it selfishly ever. He only ever removes things for, from us for our good because he's a good God. Amen. 
But Paul stands there and he says, listen to me, church. I, the apostle Paul, have actually suffered the loss of everything that I might gain Christ. It's three levels and it's massive. It's massive to me. There's a, there's a movie that I saw and it was about the apostle Paul. And I don't watch every Christian movie, just for the record. But this one had some good stuff. And he looks like Paul, right? Like, how could you not? But anyway, um, in this, and, and, and this little illustration comes up because he's in prison in the movie and there's a Roman guard that comes up to him and starts talking to him and asking him questions about his life and how he can be the way that he is. And the guard at one point looks at Paul and says, how can you endure all of this? How do you do it? And he says something in this movie and this is not scripture. I just need to say that officially. But it definitely sounds like something Paul would have said. But Paul's answer is, he's like, you gotta imagine a guy on the boat in an ocean. And the man on the boat reaches down and scoops up some water in his hand and sits there and watches all the water filter out of his hand. And he's like, and there's a, there's a desire to hold on to it, but you can't hold on to it. He's like, Christians, don't look at their lives that way. Christians realize that we have the ocean. That Christ is the treasure and Christ is everything. Amen. And we have him because he said we have him and we have him eternally and we will never lose the greatest treasure that there ever was. And why are we trying to grasp on to these tiny treasures the way that the world does? And all these little coins are falling through our hands and, and, and we're trying to be in control. Ever try to be in control? <laughs> Jesus said it a different way. So, so Paul does kind of this garbage sorting picture for us. Jesus does it slightly different. Matthew 13, 44, he says, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Okay, so you're following him? Just two little parables here. And Jesus is like, this is what salvation is like. This is what giving Jesus your entire life looks like. It's like somebody who's just like walking through a farm field one day and they find buried treasure in it. And they're like, I know what I'll do. I'll go and sell everything I've got and I'll just buy the field. Because if I buy the field, then I get the treasure that's there. And he says, and then the man goes and joyfully liquidates every single asset that he has so that he can buy that one treasure. And he does it with joy. Amen. Jesus is saying, I'm the treasure. Amen. Jesus Christ is the treasure. You're like, see, there's all these blessings that we get from God, right? Like we get wisdom and we get freedom, we get purpose and we get, we get all these wonderful things. But ultimately the real treasure is Jesus himself. Right. And sometimes even as Christians, we, we forget that. And again, we start to grasp onto that water, right? And we can't hold it. But Jesus is like, the Christian is the person who with joy goes and says, I surrender everything because I get Jesus. Like that's, real salvation. And you're like, wait a second, are, are we saying that we're trying to earn something or, or that it requires this kind of massive surrender in order to have my name written in the book of life in heaven? That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, as a Christian, if you don't surrender all of that stuff, you won't have room in your heart for him. There's only so much space if I'm loving all these other treasures, I don't have enough love left for the real treasure. Do I? And how many times in your life is God taking you through a trial or he's taking you through a hard time or he's taking something out of your life in order to remove the love that you had for all of those different things. And all of a sudden you find yourself trusting him and loving him more than you ever have before. Jesus said, people go and they sell everything they have with joy to have me. Yes. 
Psalm 23, verse one, the Lord is my shepherd, so I have all that I need. That's a really old verse. A lot of us grew up quoting that one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Maybe just in a different translation. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore I'm good. Right? right? <laughs> like to, to have the treasure and say, and therefore I don't need any of the other treasures so that I can have Jesus. Second Corinthians 1, 8 through 9 says it like this, slightly different way. Maybe this will help. This is Paul talking about one of the great trials that he went through. He says, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and we learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. Because that's us. Like we rely on all these different things, but it's in those trials that we realize it's like, part of what made this so painful is that I was trusting the wrong things and I can only trust him. And sadly, he had to take some things away from me before I understood that. Um, this last October was my seven year anniversary, my family moving here, me becoming pastor here at Grace Fellowship Church, which is awesome, I love that. Um, but when we moved here, my kids were in junior high and early high school. And as much as Linda and I felt absolutely convinced that God had led us to Lawton, Oklahoma from central Illinois, um, my kids were not of the same opinion. <laughs> and we didn't talk about it a lot then because we weren't ready to. But it was a tough move. And they were angry because they had friendships and they had uh, relational networks and they had mentors and they had youth groups that they were a part of and, and things that, at school that they were involved in and a neighborhood that they loved and just went on and on and on. And, and they had to let all of that stuff go and they had to leap into a whole new community and rebuild from scratch. Now, some of you military people are looking at me like, yeah, that's the story of my life like every two to three years. But they didn't have the skills for that yet. And they were angry and were saying, hey, but God has led us and called us. And, and you know, there's, there's statements being made like, well, maybe he called you, but did he call us? And, and how do I know that dad just didn't have bad pizza the night before and he actually heard God? And, you know, all of this kind of stuff. I mean, all these things were the discussions. And, and we got a healthy home where, where, where people can express their very real feelings and be honest with each other. And man, they were taking advantage a lot of anger was coming out and it took a while. Can I tell you, it took a while. And there were nights that we were going to bed at night and, we're, and Linda and I are staring at the ceiling, sometimes with tears in our eyes saying, God, are our kids gonna be okay? God, are we gonna be okay with them? God, maybe we're gonna be okay with them, but maybe they'll come out of this so bitter they'll turn from Jesus their whole life. God, did we just lose our kids? We're asking those kinds of questions. And it took a long time. Very, very slowly, God started to break through. And we didn't even see it. We didn't know it was happening. Sometimes, te sometimes teenagers don't talk to you. But I remember the very first time that one of them later on began to admit what God had done in their life and the fact that the trial that was so fierce for them had actually driven them from all those old connections that they thought made them strong and made them rely 100% on God. And they were sitting there telling me and all three of them told me this at different points in, in their life, in their teenage life, that if God hadn't brought me from Illinois, I don't think my faith would be what it is today. So not only did I not lose my kids, but God used this terrible trial <laughs> to rescue them. But you don't know that when you're in the middle of it. That's where the trust comes in. Oh, 
It's such a walk, isn't it? We think that with our human math, we can protect this little amount of water in our hand and we can't. We've got to trust God. Philippians 3.20, this is the second piece that Paul gives us. He says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. He will take our weak mortal, mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. So he's come out of this thing saying, I've suffered all of this for the sake of Jesus Christ. And of course, the most natural thing just a few verses later is that he would be saying, and I can't wait to see Jesus Christ. I can't wait for heaven. I can't wait till I get to walk face to face with the very savior that I love and I've given my whole life to. And what you start to see in this, in this moment that just comes kind of pouring out of Paul is he's like, listen, we're eagerly waiting for him. Like we can't wait. And that, that might sound odd to some of you, but, but that's the way a Christian thinks. Because if Jesus is real and our love for him is real, then you're gonna want to see him. This is just something, it, it's not something that you choose to try to think about heaven. This is the kind of thing that starts to naturally come out of you when you love him. And uh, how to say this? It wasn't a religion to Paul. It wasn't a philosophy. It wasn't a movement that he hoped would somehow solidify his legacy as a man after his death. All of that stuff, it wasn't any of that stuff to him. It was truly a pile of garbage to him and then one treasure. And it was Jesus Christ and he loved Jesus Christ. And, 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 and you got to say that because it, it's, it's this essential part of the whole picture. You ask the question, how do you go through a prison and not get bitter? Part of it, and it's inescapable. Are you authentically in love with Jesus Christ or no? And that's not any form of an accusation. It's, it's nothing like that. It's just, it's something that happens to you or it hasn't happened to you. And if it hasn't happened to you, you need it. Like this isn't one of those optional things. Like I'm just the person who never fell in love with Jesus. No, it's essential or you won't make it. It's weird to say, fall in love with Jesus. And I know that internally, some of you are rolling your eyes at me. You know who you are. Because it sounds like romantic language. I know that. And I know that's weird to say about Jesus. But here's what Christians do. Christians come into this place where they're like, I don't just love God as a loyalty decision. I don't just believe God as a mental decision that I've agreed to these terms. <clears throat> I passionately adore him for all that he's done for me, for all that he is. I trust him and I adore him and I struggle to find language for it beyond just saying, I'm in love with Jesus. Amen. It's the closest thing I know to describing what it actually is. But to be in a place where what comes out of you naturally is I'm waiting eagerly to be face to face with the savior because I've waited so long. That's what comes out. Jesus must be more and more our treasure. Philippians 4, 4. And now I'm jumping ahead into the next chapter and I'm gonna move to this next section fast. But he says, choose joy daily and turn your fears into prayer. Always be full of joy in the Lord. He says, I say it again, rejoice. He's talking about joy there, like it's a choice, not just a feeling. It's an action. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. He can't stop talking about Jesus coming back, by the way. Verse six, don't worry about anything. Easy for you to say, Paul. You know, just don't worry about anything. But that's not the end. Look at the rest of what he says. Instead, pray about everything. 
Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So what's he saying? He's saying, um, like sometimes people will come to me and be like, okay, Jesus said I'm supposed to go into my prayer closet and just spend time talking to God praying. I have no idea, pastor, what to pray for. I have no idea where, where to start. Here's Paul's answer. Are you afraid of anything? Do you have any anxieties in your life? Anything about the future? Anything about present day? Because all of those anxieties, all of those fears, all of those worries, just sit down and write them down. That's your prayer list. That's what you're gonna start talking to God about. He doesn't just say, don't worry. He says, don't just worry, but take your requests to God. Turn your worries into prayer requests. That's the content of your time of prayer with God. Amen. So I wanna say, God, this is what's going on in my life. This is what's keeping me up at night. Like, I'm going to tell you all about it. I'm also going to thank you and I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise you. It's all in the Lord's prayer. You'll see it all right there. But this is what Paul is calling us to. Next, verse 10, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. Now, this, this feels a little bit different. The Philippian church had sent a care package to Paul and it wasn't cookies. It was probably money. Might have been some food. Definitely clothing but they sent it to him because they knew he was under house arrest. He says, I know you always have been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. How in the world can you be in prison, Paul, with nothing and say you have all that you need? It's perspective. Say perspective. Perspective. He says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret, there's that phrase again, of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or with little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, some of you were little kids growing up in the church and you memorized verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can move this mountain through Christ who gives me strength. I can pray for the sick through Christ who gives me, I can do all of this stuff through Christ who gives me strength. Look at the context of that passage right there. I can do all things. He's saying I can live through anything. I can be content in any situation. You can do whatever you want to me and I am absolutely unstoppable because Christ gives me strength. See, that's a contentment verse. It's a perseverance. It's a perspective verse. Maybe not the way that you were taught to quote it. That word contentment there in the Greek, um, it just means to be contained, self-contained, self-sufficient is what the word means. It means to be satisfied or possessing enough. I, I love it. The, the, the word in essence means I look at what I have and I say, it's enough. What I have is enough. So often we look at what we have and we think it's not enough. It's the essence of disappointment, right? It's the essence of our prison. Paul says, I can look at what's in front of me, whatever it is, because it was all on the garbage pile anyway. I sold it all so that I could have Christ. And when I look at empty and Christ, it's enough. That's a statement. That's a heart statement. It's a prayer that you can pray in the midst of your pain is what God has given me today is enough. Oh, it's a bold prayer to pray. Paul had learned contentment. Notice that contentment is not natural. Oh, I should have gotten an amen on that one. You're not born with it. He doesn't even call contentment a spiritual gift. He said, you have to learn contentment. And we have to learn contentment. All right, almost done. Verse 18, at the moment, he says, I have all I need and more. <laughs> what a great line. You're in the middle of prison with nothing, Paul. And you say, you have all that you need and more. So it sure looks like God guarantees us our needs, but not our greeds right? 
We've got some wants mixed in there. I am generously supplied with the gifts that you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me so well will supply all of your needs too, church, from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. That's perspective again. God will supply our needs, not our greeds. Corey Ten Boom, who I talked about last week, said it this way. She said, you will never know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all that you have. Amen. All of a sudden, our prisons might become our blessings, right? It might be exactly what God knew that we needed. So often we look up at God and we say, why? Why did you let this thing happen? And I don't want to answer for him, but sometimes he's reorienting our piles a bit. Sometimes he's getting us free from the things that we depended on that were gonna let us down anyway because they always do, don't they? And so many of the things that we worship in this life, they bring their darkness into our hearts, don't they? They start to twist us into different people that we never intended to be. But you can worship Jesus for eternity and he'll only make you better. He's a good God. There's a story I was reading and it's about a church in Uganda and I'll finish with this. <clears throat> but in Uganda in 1971, there was a dictator that came and took power and this pastor wrote this story in some discipleship materials I've been going through and the pastor's name is Peter Kazirivu, something like that, anyway. But he told the story of back in 1971 and he was part of a church and he was pastoring in this church and this dictator named uh, Idi Amin came and took over and they didn't know he was a bad guy at first, but ultimately in his eight years in power, he killed 500,000 people. He's a bad dude. So after he gains power, one of the things that he starts to do is he begins to oppress the Christian church in the country. And he, first, things, first thing he does, he exiles all the Christian missionaries from other countries, gives them 48 hours to leave the country or they'll be imprisoned or killed. He closes all the churches down at that time. He decides to imprison all believers who claim Christ. Um, he described, the pastor did, he described this one Sunday where they were all worshiping on a Sunday and they were in the churches and truckloads of soldiers began to pull up outside the churches because they knew all the Christians would be gathered on that day, of course. And they got out and they said all the Christians onto the truck to haul them all off to prison and some to death. The remaining church that were not caught went underground. And the way he described it, in retrospect, is he said, you know, so many thought they had a faith, but it went to a whole new place when you've got to believe in the face of imprisonment and death. You just start to depend on him in a different way. It purified the church. It purified them because their motives had to be in the right place. He said people who were getting saved and there were many people that were getting saved even under that persecution. He said the, the kind of commitment that they made to Christ, they weren't just changing religions. They weren't coming and evaluating the, the ministry offerings of your church or whether or not they liked your music that you were playing. It meant something to come to your church and to, to choose Jesus. He had to be your only treasure for real. And the church that this pastor was a part of, he said this gospel preaching church had 50 congregations across the country when the persecution started. By the time they got their freedom, eight years later, they were at 500 congregations. Because that's what God does to us in the midst of persecution, in the midst of prison, doesn't he? This is his quote. He says, God sits on his throne and is sovereign. He reigns above all rulers of the earth. He is good, but he has not promised us only peace. He has promised to be with us, even in the times when our lives are threatened. I want you guys stand.
we're in a lot of different places across this room and online today. The kind of prison that you're in, the kind of difficulty that you're going through right now or have been going through. Maybe God had come to set you free from some things and you thought God was just taking things away from you. Maybe he's speaking to you right now. Maybe part of what's coming to your heart right now is this idea of loving Jesus that much as your treasure and everything in your life, every day of your life, making him more and more the treasure of your life. And how does that work? And going back and reading the words of the gospels again and, and just, just devouring Jesus's words to you all over again, to fall in love with him again, to be amongst his people again, to ask him to show you in prayer how he's been working in your life and how he's been loving you all this time. I'm praying that God would reignite your passion for the savior today because that's what gets you through. Let's pray. Jesus, no matter where we're at today, Lord, I pray that you would call us. And God, I, I, I lo just love the way that you work, Holy Spirit. You're so individual. So God, come and speak to our individual needs. Lord, we want some of that resilience that Paul had. We want some of that faith. We want some of that love that he had. So Jesus, would you come and do that miracle inside of us? God, if we're in a spot right now where if we're honest, we never really did sell it all for Jesus. We never gave it all away for him. Lord, I pray that you would do that miracle right now in our hearts. Only you can. And God, maybe we tried and, and maybe that love didn't ignite for real. It's still this whole time, it's been a religion. It's been a philosophy. It's been a thing to do. Lord, would you supernaturally do a miracle in those hearts and create that passionate love for you, Jesus? And God, I pray that we would ask for it. I pray that we would want it. I pray that we would welcome it, Lord. Change us as families. Change us as a church. In Christ's name, amen.